What if you could have more awareness around your legacy, even if it's new to you and your family? I'd like to welcome Alex Kirby today to the Design Your Legacy podcast. He is the Chief Executive Officer to Total Family Management. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, and you're joining from the East Coast, is that correct? Yeah, Maryland. Wonderful, wonderful. So would you share with the listeners kind of the origin story? How did you start? Did you found Total Family Management? Are you just leading it now as an executive? What's the what's the backstory? Yeah, uh, founder and CEO, uh, TFM, we go by TFM, just a couple of years old of a, of a company. We've been working with families now for, for a couple of years. And um, the simplest way to think about what we're doing is private virtual family coaching. We, ha- we get clients from all over. We get clients from estate attorneys, we get clients from wealth management firms. Sometimes it's executives or families find us directly. But the simplest way to think about what we're doing is family coaching. That's lovely. And I I think you had shared a part of your background is that you were working with training and development and different uh, coaching different individuals out of Silicon Valley or in the San Francisco area. And you came across a gentleman and the focus was so much on encouraging him to align with like the company vision. And yet you wondered why is his personal life being ignored? Because he's still a whole human being. Yeah. No, I mean, there's like tons of the the origin story of TFM um, from that conversation. Like what you're talking about right there is we had a, there was a big tech company in San Francisco. I'd gone out there to do some work with that particular executive around the priorities, the strategic priorities of, of the organization in the next like six to 12 months. He was totally off his game, which was uncommon. For him. And it's normal. It happens to even the right? best of us. No doubt. Everyone right. has good days, but he just seemed off. And I was like, what's going on? And we knew each other pretty well. He said, I'm going through a divorce. And I'm looking at all the stuff that we're doing in terms of the priorities of, of our org. And I'm thinking that I don't have those for my own life. And I'm wondering why I'm spending time on this. And, you know, for me, that was like, like I shared with you, my parents are divorced. That, that has always been a fear of mine. You know, I'm, I'm happily married, but it's like, I don't want to get divorced. So on this plane ride home, I'm like, how do I, I agree. I don't have my own priorities figured out. I'm not sure what my values are as a family. And as I start to start to look for those resources, I couldn't really find what I was looking for. And since I had spent most of my career in leadership development, development, big company, small company as a consultant, sort of two big things kind of became clear to me. One is a lot of the stuff we were doing was applicable to families. A lot of the frameworks, a lot of the ideas were applicable to families if you just thought of a family as a team. Once you kind of made that switch and you're like a family is a team, your household is a team, you and your partner, however you want to define it then you can apply a lot of those things to families. And then two, it was like, to the point that this gentleman made, if you're going to start somewhere, why not start in an area of your life that most people view as the most important part of their life, their personal life, their family, right? If you're gonna start somewhere, if you're gonna work on your communication, you could work on your communication with your coworkers, like that's great, but, if you can work on your communication with the people you care about the most, with the people that that you have most to gain on, that'll translate to work. And that's kind of like how we got to where we are are now, a a whole bunch of events like that. Thank you for, for, for speaking into that. It's so fascinating because there are statistics out there that tell us that I think it's something like 60% of success is based on when there's great communication and trust. And yet it's one of those pink elephants in the room that people yet don't give enough value to or have metrics around or keep KPIs, keep performance indicators. And yet right. it's it's so valuable, especially for our overall, uh, you, you spoke about this idea of, of health in our preamble just now, um, but it's it's looking into this idea of, gosh, we're whole human beings. We're more than just you know how we perform financially. And so why not honor this void in the marketplace? Yeah, for sure. 
So what's a success story that you've come across in making this area a, what somebody might call a life priority or a life strategy? Yeah, I mean, you know, as I told you before, like we feel like mental fitness, family coaching to us is just going to the gym for your family. It's a simple way to think about it. If you have a family coach, it doesn't mean that your family is like broken. Just like if you go to the gym, it doesn't mean you're unhealthy. It actually means that you care enough about your physical health to like stay in shape, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're doing is we're working with people who already are really excited about some of this stuff and they're just looking for resources and ways to help. And so when you start to have these conversations, which with families, it could be like, we have examples of people retiring early, having a conversation and realizing, oh, you know what? Like, I'm not really sure what I'm holding on for. I want to retire. Or um, being a grandparent is really important to me. We hear this a lot from our, from our clients. We've seen people move closer to their grandkids because when they start to have this conversation, they're like, actually, being a grandparent is the number one thing that's important to me. So let me make sure that like how I'm ideally want to be and how my actions are, are a little more aligned. It could be something like quitting a job that you don't like, right? We've seen a lot of that over time. There's been a huge value shift in society, you know, kind of started in COVID, but it was already sort of there where people are reevaluating what's important to them. And I think we're just part of that process. But to us, like most of the stuff that we see is incremental. It's not like a, you know, a, an aha moment where someone has one conversation with TFM and then they change everything about their life. That's not really what we're, what we're working on. Uh, your relationships with your family, your vision, communication, you alluded to that. These are like, we call them constant work problems. You can't just work on your relationship with your family one day a year at like a retreat. You just work on it constantly over time. And so just like one other quick example that is smaller, but I think really, really powerful is we have a workshop where uh, a, a parent or two partners get to talk about their kids individually. So it's really, really fun because they get to look at, you know, whether you have two, three, four, five kids, it's like, what does this one kid need? How are we showing up for them? What, what do they have going on? How are we communicating? Because it isn't always the same, right? Any parent listening that has multiple kids know that like, they're all different. So you get to talk about these kids individually. And there's, there's an example where, and this is uh, parents with an adult child, they weren't on the same page. They, they weren't really agreeing with a lot of the decisions that this child was making. It wasn't a child. It's, he's in his late twenties and he's an adult offspring, an adult offspring. Right. And so he's, they're not agreeing to it and it's leading to just deterioration in their relationship. Like stop going to family events, not enjoying their time together. And in this conversation, they sort of like reflected on, the fact that they just wanted to get their relationship back on the right track. They're like, we don't even care about what we're fighting about anymore. Now we feel like we've lost this great relationship with our son. And the connection. And, so, and the connection. And so they like went over with some food and just hung out and made a concerted effort to not like bring up all the stuff that they knew was going to be a thing. And they just enjoyed their time together. And when they left, he sent them a text and was like, Hey, I really enjoyed you coming over. Like, I'd love to do that again. And so that's like a small thing that isn't a, you know, aha moment, but it gave, it gave the parents an opportunity to like reflect on something that was important to them and just make a small tweak. Yeah. I think that's a lovely story, especially because I think that these days it, it, people need to become more conscientious and aware. And it's not just the, uh, um, uh, performance uh, ability of that child to attend a certain university or a school or to meet an expectation of an ideal that that parent has because 
let's say that that adult offspring falls short, then will the parents and the rest of the family miss out on all the other good things just because they don't fit inside of the box? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I know that uh, your organization has also, I think it's four modules uh, a year and it can go on for 16 years and we're going to get into the process in a moment. But um, why do you think um, individuals are becoming more intentional these days in answering that question around where is it that you're going? Do you think it's because we've just lived through COVID and everything kind of got tossed up in the air and we had to find our center and our North Star again? Or, or why do you think it's now become so valuable? Yeah, in terms of like why people are embracing these now? Well, sure. The, uh, why do they care? Or are they realizing that distractions are getting in the way and life would be more meaningful if they have that connection and they explored getting a family coach so things just don't fall through the cracks of you know all the things we don't talk about or is it possible that we can have a bond other than just money <laughs> yeah yeah no you know it's a good question i you know i don't totally know i certainly feel like um you know our contemporaries you know say people maybe like 35 to 50 tend to be a little bit more comfortable talking about mental health having conversations, just being open about like how they're feeling than the previous generations. And we're also going through this like evolution of, do I want all the stuff that was true of my childhood to be true of the childhood for my kids? You know, and, and some of it is great that like we miss and we want to preserve. And then some of it might be like, I actually didn't like that we couldn't talk about a lot of this stuff or I didn't like that you know we see a lot of families like like your your clientele in particular families struggle to talk about money right that's like a normal family thing talking about money is rude or you know what whatever pretentious and, yeah right or or yeah pretentious or rude or 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 what have you but like these topics um none of these things are givens Right. Like you can make the, the small changes over time. So I think it's part of like a generational change. And, you know, us, you know, us as as now the new leaders of of this world from 35 to 50, kind of trying to make the changes that, that we want to see. Yes. Well, I know one of the things that you shared in our icebreaker conversation is oftentimes clients will say to you, Alex, we should have had that conversation years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I wondered what other feedback they may have given to you uh, and provided in going, gosh, that was a valuable conversation to have about looking at a focus of that one child, even though the child is now an adult offspring. I just wondered if there was any other feedback that you could share kind of on the moment, on the spot. Yeah, I mean, like we have, uh, we have very strong feedback from, from all of our clients. You know, we have lots of referrals. Um, they form strong bonds with their coaches. Um, so it's way more common that we would hear something that there is way less common that we would hear something that was bad where we have to dig in and find the, find the good stuff. But, you know, we had this, we had a uh, doctor tell us, um, we're here so we don't end up in therapy. And, you know, her, her kind of stance was we're really healthy. Like our family is in a great place and we want to make sure that we stay that way. So that was a really cool lens for us, you know, to see a really healthy, normal, awesome family be proactive to stay that way, right? Because like, if you, as soon as you sort of take your physical health for granted and you stop going to the gym, then you start to slide sort of back. But we hear, you know, we hear a lot I'm of just, great- Sorry to interrupt. I just think yeah, that yeah. that is just such a smart decision whether it's preventive maintenance or just the fact that to be good and to stay good takes that effort of like showing up once a week to that gym or showing up once a week to that coaching session or showing up once a quarter to Alex's online modules. Yeah. Of yeah. Total I mean, management. I, on the, on the mental health front, like obviously you have clinical environments, right. But mm -hmm. in the, if you were comparing that to physical health, that might be more like surgery in physical health, but way before you have surgery, years and years before, you could have 
change your diet. You could have, you know, worked out on a regular basis. You could have, you know, done whatever. So for us, you know, when we think about the, the mental side of this, like a really good friend, a conversation with a really good friend is a form of early intervention. If you have good, strong relationships in your life, that's going to help you not get to the point where you have to do a, an inter, a, you know, a more drastic intervention. Um, and so that's just kind of how we think about it, early intervention and, and letting people focus on what's important to them. That's so cool. Thank you for speaking into that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that um, retaining a coach or um, a service such as yours is invaluable because um, I might call it just having that truthful person in your life, the truth agent. I wrote an Instagram post about this recently. Imagine that you're surrounded by a bunch of people and they might have, um, you know, either they don't know because they have only a certain amount of life experiences, or there could be hidden motivations, hidden agendas. You can find one person in your life or even a team that could just tell you your blind spots on a weekly basis, how much better you are. And you're smiling because you must understand this. If yeah, you're standing that's... alone in a room and you just want one person tell it, tell you what it is you can't see that everyone else seems to know about. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's really, I mean, the objective nature of our coaches, I think is, is really, really powerful. Um, we don't have, our coaches don't have sales goals. They're not trying to sell you life insurance at the or end upsell. of a conversation, right. Mm -hmm. Or upsell in any way whatsoever. So Families are naturally skeptical. There's people listening right now that are like family coaching. I don't know. And how, what we're trying to do to lower the barriers to that is. So when, when you join TFM as, as a member, you do eight onboarding workshops in the first year. After that, you can decide what to do, but these eight foundational workshops are how we kind of like introduce families to these ideas. If you go through three of them, and you don't like it, we give you a full refund. You can stop and we give you a full refund. So we feel so strong about the impact that we're making that we wanted to put a brand promise behind it to give people, make them feel comfortable to try it. And if you don't like it, that's okay. But we don't have a lot of people that are calling us and saying that it wasn't a good use of their time. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think that's, um a practical way for them to step into these new conversations. And I think a part of the um, resistance of, of asking, well, why should we invest in family coaching? It's probably because their parents didn't. So then they have to be the pioneer and, and realize it. But I think it's just also just really valuable today. There was a TEDx talk by Brene Brown. This is like Americans today. We're like the most medicated, most distracted. And it's because people need to have more opportunities to be seen, heard, and understood. So let me let me go to the woo-woo dark side for a moment, okay? Um, let's say that there could be a victim mindset in society, and it is not independent, or I'm sorry, it's not dependent on net worth, where somebody could feel entitled, the, you know, the world owes me. So how do you shift that then? Um, or do you come across all any of that? Because you're asking people in a sense that when they define their values and get to align them, that completely is like a redirect over to not even like feeding like the bad wolf on their shoulder of like, oh, I'm the victim. If they're so focused on values, they can't have the pity party or the entitlement party. What say you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't totally know how to answer that, Angelina, you know, other than the fact that like the topics that we're trying to talk about, the topics that we feel like people come to us about most of the time, wealth firms and estate firms. It's always like this big conversation about I'll, an example might be um, we have a bunch of money that our kids are going to inherit and they don't know how much it is, or we don't know how to structure the trust or we, you know, those types of conversations. But to us, that's like walking in to the gym and trying to lift the heaviest possible weight you can find first, right? Might not be the the right place to start. And, but I think naturally the people that gravitate towards something like coaching are people that are interested in growth, are open to ideas. They read a lot. They, they run a lot. They're like, like, I know you're already there because you're a coach, but it's like, they're recommending books to their friends. They're starting book clubs. They're, they're sending posts around. They're like, 
constantly looking to grow. And then there is a small subset of the population that are just like, it's not for me. And, you know, for those people, we just say, that's okay. Like we're not for everyone, but there are people that are looking for help and guidance and want to take more control. So if, if you're kind of like blaming everyone else and not willing to take any personal agency of it, you, this might not totally resonate with you. Yeah. What I like about what you s shared just now is that if let's say uh, there, uh, there's a client and they're about to, you know, walk into the gym and, and you've got to help them lift like the heaviest weight. What I like about what you shared is if you get them started to identify and clarify their vision and their values, they can start setting mental habits where it's like they go to that place in their mind of like, well, I'm honoring beauty or I'm honoring a growth mindset, or I'm honoring that value of whatever it is. And we're going to talk about more uh, in, about values in a moment compared to if they find themselves stuck in a moment and then they go to like the unhealthy habit. And maybe that moment is like, they're going out with their friends and they're like, Hey, um, you know, Alex, you just inherited $30 million. You're picking up the tab for the night, bro. Right. Right, right, <laughs> and then right. that, that individual can feel isolated or alienated. But if they can go to that place in their mind of like, well, I've explored values. So I know the place to go to compared to um, getting crushed by the weight of something that's brand new as an experience. Yeah, I, I think one of the reasons that people are a little hesitant about these conversations about because like, we know the stats about how many people have estates done or how many people have wills done you know, all, all we we know all these stats, right? So it's like, why are people avoiding it? One of the things that we think is that we know that vision comes before planning. And we talk about this all the time with, with our wealth firms and with our state firms, vision comes before planning. So if you think about like, if you're, if you're building your dream house, right, is your first step to go grab a bunch of wood and start nailing pieces of wood together right? Probably not. And you might even be like pushing so strong against it. You're like, I'm not ready to start building. But one of the reasons is because they don't have a vision for where it's going to end up. And if you start the conversation with like, which direction should the house face? What rooms are the most important? How do we want to feel when we're in the house? Like if you start there with people, then you can get to the planning conversation much easier because they can look out and see kind of where it's going. If you start with just handing people, you know, the structure of the wood, hey, you need to have an estate plan. I understand why people are hesitant to do it because they don't totally know where it's going to lead them. I think it's brilliant you're asking that question because can you imagine how many other people are or are not asking them that question? And yet there's an expectation they're going to build a brilliant house. Right. Yeah. No pressure. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, you and um, I think it's your associate, Katie, mentioned that values are priorities as well as goals. Would you say more? Yeah, sure. Katie uh, Jezinowski is our chief marketing officer. She's awesome. And um, we talk about values as priorities from like a few different lenses. Um, the first is if you have, you know, like just in the, you know, there's probably a lot of business leaders listening to this podcast. If you, know, if you came into your team and you're like, hey, here are our 72 priorities for the week, that would be a little confusing to people, right? The, the friend to all is a friend to none, Aristotle, Taylor Swift, whoever you wanna you know, quote, quote that on. You have to narrow it down because you know, val we start with 72 values when, you, when we do our values exercises with families, start with 72. None of the words are bad right? They're all virtuous words, loyalty, adventure, kindness, but you can't be all of them. So going through the exercise of figuring out what values you're going to protect and then not compromise on, like that's the real test of the value is, can you hold this true even when it's not easy to do? You know, if you held up, if you had like, we do value signs for our clients sometimes, and like, so they have four or five family values and they'll be up on the wall. And another test is if you put your four family values up on the wall and someone you knew walked into your house and saw them, would they be like, that sounds about right. That's kind of what you want, right? You don't want to have to hide from your values. You want them to be like so intrinsic in how you're behaving that people are like, 
Oh, presents. Yeah, they are like, that family's never on their phone. I always feel like when they're with us, like we have their full attention and, and we feel, we love being with them. Like that's what you want people to feel. So when we say values are priorities, it's not like in that true sense, but more in the sense of you can't be everything to everyone. So taking the time to figure out what you're not going to compromise on is a good exercise. Yeah, that's, that's just brilliant and lovely. And um, because uh, I liked what you said about uh, if there's a value and it's like, which values are you going to protect? Because nobody likes confrontation, but confrontation is going to come up, whether it's uh, within a family conversation or whether they get, let's say, invited into like a, a nonprofit or a board and, um, or it's a work scenario or a social scenario. And yeah, confrontation is not fun, but those are the, the moments where one is tested. Will they stand by their value and feel right. in integrity afterwards? Or will they uh, back away because they're not sure, how do I dance with that? How do I be with that in claiming that space? Yeah. yeah. I, and I wanted to mention something else about values that you made. It was a point you made in a prior podcast where you could be in a room with someone and someone else could have a value that say you don't have, but you go, wow, the way that they hold that value, I would have never noticed or cherished it. But now I have a newfound respect for that value. Would you yeah. talk about that for a moment? Because I thought, you know, that's that's incredible because that's witnessing what else is possible, even if it's not real for your world, per se. Right. Yeah. I mean, the you know, one of the actually like when we do family values, you know, so I'll use an example for my own life. Like when we do family values, that 72 list, eat, most of the, if we have two partners or two spouses, they go through the list individually first. All right. So they narrow down to their their own individual five values. And it's fun as we go through. And then when they compare, you know, it's never the same. And you know, we've had people be married for 40 years and married for two years and it's never the same. So it's not like it's bad if your values are off. They don't have to be 100 percent lined up. But in your partner, you might see something that you didn't have or that you want your kids to have, or you wish you had more of, um, you know, our, one of our family values is kindness. That doesn't come from me. You know, I, it's not that I'm like not kind, but my wife and her family, I, I feel like it's, they wear their hearts on their sleeve. They lead with kindness in so many amazing ways. And, and that's so what they I, bring forward. That's right. And I've learned that and like the power of that. And I also wish I had more of that in my life earlier so that I saw that like, you know, I have a deep appreciation for it, but now I've seen the power of it. And so I would say like, that's the best example for me because we took, you know, I took something that I saw in my partner and then, you know, we made a concerted effort to make that part of like our unified kind of family approach. That's so nice because uh, it's, it's almost like a lens that you can look at now into the world. Like if I look, at the world, world through kindness, this is what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, the, the values for us are, um, they're really fun and they're not. Uh, I heard one of your guests say, talking about estate planning stuff and they were like, just get started. Just like do a little bit. Cause it's so big that people are like, ah, I can never, you know, and so they don't do anything. So for us, for values, it's like, do the values exercise with us. We're going to narrow it down. They're not set in stone. You can look at them six months later and say, oh, you know what? I actually don't think that's totally what we're about. But once you do the exercise of like getting there, you can then like kind of like tweak it. We had community as a value, my wife and I. And we were driving to this wedding and I looked at them and I like reminded her what they were. And I'm like, which of these values don't you think like makes sense for us? And she's like, community. I'm like, that's what I thought. Should we get rid of it? She's like, yeah, let's just get rid of it. So we just got rid of that value. But now like the ones that we have, we feel really good about. And when you say lens, you can use values to help you make decisions, right? When you are faced with a tough decision as a family, estate planning, what, like when you're thinking about these things, values are one way to look at the problem. So everyone's not coming at it from a totally different lens. It's like, Hey, remember this value lens we agreed on? Let's look at it through this and see what, what we see on the other side. Yes. And one of the things 
speaking of family and 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 the values that uh, you, you and your wife share, um, you you've uh, you've leaned into this portal, and I don't know if I should put you on the spot and have you share screen, but I and because I know that during the um, that icebreaker conversation, I was just so floored, not just by the fact that you build a whole curriculum around this, which is amazing, but also that there is this portal where somebody can go and visually uh, upload photos. I mean, I'm all about the hardcover coffee table book, but I also love the idea of virtual. I think it's all good. And that was also, yeah. yeah can that, I share the screen? Yeah. And it'll work oh, absolutely. For I've already, I've already, yes. Okay, great. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So like, you know, this is my family. I, I don't want to show like I don't want to show anyone else's family except except my own here, um, but our family for our CT so we built everything. When I say we, I mean our CTO, um, who who is is brilliant in in so many different ways. But there was kind of two problems that we were trying to solve here, um, and I learned early on like I would kind of be talking to him about the features that we wanted or the things that we were trying to do. And I learned early on, bring problems to him, not ideas. And so the two, there was kind of two problems. One is how easy can we make this for families to do coaching? Because if it's not practical, if it's not easy, the families aren't going to do it, right? So the, the first thing is like, it's virtual. Our scheduling is done inside. Our video is done inside, so they don't have to go download a different software. They communicate with their coach inside of the platform. We're, we're doing everything we can to make it as easy as possible for families to jump on, interact with their coach, have a great conversation, and then get back to their busy, normal, everyday life. The second piece was like my something I brought from the challenges I'd seen in professional development, which is you have to find a way for people to see their progress. And if, you, if people don't see their progress, it demotivates them. So how do you see progress as a family is a kind of a hard question to answer, um, but it wasn't AUM for me, right? The stock market performance- Assets under management, keep going. Yeah, ass, yeah, thank you. Assets under management did not represent how I felt like my family was performing. And when we would do these amazing exercises, like if you've ever done uh, any workshop with a coach, a lot of times it gets written on a post-it or a notebook or something. And then it goes into a drawer and it doesn't get looked at. And for us, we wanted to find a way to like bring all this amazing work that people were doing to life so that they could tweak it and reference it and use it over time and, um, and that's how we got to relate. This is called relate. You can see it in the, the top corner here. This is our, our software. Every family gets access to this when they, when they work with us. Um, and we hope it's a place for them to kind of, you know, start to build that legacy. I think it is such a great idea to visually offer that feedback because you're right. I think this idea of having feedback loops around like love and fulfillment and um, some of those intangibles are just as important as measuring our, 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 our ROI went up and we can see that through the stocks uh, and, and the, the graphs and the pie charts. But then it's like, well, where is the, uh, the visual representation to come back so that somebody can see that they're making progress with this other stuff? Yeah, which leads me to my next question, <laughs> which is um, families pass on much more than assets and liabilities, whether it's financial or emotional. And I know one of the things that you've spoken into is that values are one of the most important things that we can pass on. So I know that um, I think you start your clients off with, I think like module one is like vision, and then you might move into, and you're going to have to clarify this because I don't know your curriculum by heart. And then they move to, okay, so I'll let you take the stage here. Yeah. So the question is, um, it has to to do around, uh, you know, where do you start a client in your process of knowing their wealth is more than just in their financial domain? I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think if you're willing to talk to us, you're already sort of leaning that way, right? And we've seen 
a lot of families looking for a resource like this, just kind of like how I was. But particularly if you've gone through a health scare, if you've been in a bad car accident, if you've lost someone very close to you, you don't go through those experiences and come out on the other end and say, I need more money, right? It's very, very uncommon to survive a plane crash and then come out and be like, more money. That's really what a, that's really what I need to be driving towards, right? People think about these, like in these moments of clarity, they think about how they were as a parent. And what they were like as a sibling and the things that were really important to them. And there's a million awesome TED Talks about this. So the people that we're talking to kind of already have an inkling. But then our job is to slowly over time, one, acknowledge their skepticism. Because people are going to be a little skeptical about doing this type of work. But then through that skepticism, build enough trust in a family where they can start to explore some of this stuff because they might know there's more to wealth than money, but they might not totally know what it is, right? They might not totally know like what they want to pass on, how they want to think about this stuff, but they, they know that there's more to wealth than money. And they know that this isn't a topic to tread on lightly. So I'm, I'm not really sure who I can actually talk to this, this about, and it's not, a, it, it's, it's not um, you know, when you think about the estate planners and the, and the financial planners and these wealth firms, like they're coming at this problem from the lens that they understand, you know, like, and that's really, really important because they're doing amazing work. All of the wealth firms that we work with and all the estate, they're doing great work. They're just looking at it from a different lens than we are. And I think our lens in a lot of ways can be helpful to families maybe before they get to that lens, but families are already kind of, they know this, this is part of the value shift that we're talking about and they're just looking for ways to get there. Yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, I love that. And I think it's showing them also what's possible. I think attorneys and the CPAs do an amazing job, but when 60% of success is the communication and trust piece, I think a part of what the coaches bring is the real life experiences because an attorney can't walk a, a client through um, an emotional conversation if they haven't been in those shoes or walked a mile in those shoes. And I think that's where the emotional quotient or the emotional intelligent piece is so invaluable. And that's why the uh, emphasis needs to be on the elephants in the room, the pink elephants to talk about it and to bring it up and to say more is possible. Because you're right, nobody walks away from that accident, from the plane or the car or the train and says more money. <laughs> right, right. And, and the other piece of this, you know, is I don't feel, I feel like estate planning, when we hear sort of how this rolls out, just to use that as an example, a lot of times it's like you need an estate plan and a will and a trust and all this stuff. And then it's like an engagement. You know, it's a period of time, six weeks. We're going to figure all this out and then it's going to be done. And then you have it. And then we hear all these struggles of like people not updating these documents and like all this kind of stuff. So one of the things we hear from our partners is the ongoing conversation is really, really beneficial for families. You know, for the most part, we see them eight times in the first year. After that, it's kind of quarterly or it's sort of up to the family as they go. But if you can make this an ongoing conversation, right? Or it's, it's like our estate plan is never totally done, right? Then you can do it when you have energy to do it, which is really, really important because if you don't have energy to have these conversations, you're going to get a bad output. But if you slowly kind of approach it as like figuring out your estate plan, isn't one awful 48 hour conversation where you leave feeling drained. No, no, no. It's an hour a year for the rest of your life you're going to get to a better outcome thinking about it like that and doing it when you have energy than you know, forcing someone to do it and make decisions when they're not ready or they're not like totally sure what they're deciding. Yes. Yeah, that's great. I, I know you've uh, shared before. It's like, I know that there are some seminars and workshops and it's like, they'll get people in a, in a room and they'll just go at it for three days. And <laughs> when, when, when in reality is it, it can become a part of the lifestyle and they, and, and, and it can be, 
you know, a part of who that it's like, it's a part of them. It grows with them. And even uh, people can say, it's like, let's say there's a relationship. Like, let me say, like, I'll give the example of you and your wife. There's like you, your wife. And then there's a third component called the relationship. And in some yeah. ways, this is like that third thing when somebody can uh, realize it's there and intentionally develop it. So it's not just like random. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the big, the big things just aren't like, you know, when you decide to retire, you know, very rarely do you just like sit down and think about it for an hour and then emerge and you're like, I'm retiring. Right. It's like some people think about it for like a decade or more, which is smart, right? which is smart. Right. And that's what you have to do with the big decisions is like, do it over time and reflect and bounce it off of people and talk to your spouse and make sure, you know, I don't think, uh, at, you know, as you say, three days, if I try to get my wife to do anything with me for like three days related to this type of work, she would, she would kill me. Right. 90 minutes feels like a really nice space. Cause you can, you know, we have conversations after our workshops too. It's not like we leave and never talk about it again. It's like, man, that was a really good session. What'd you think about this part or da, 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 da. And it's like, you do it when you have the energy to do it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's lovely and brilliant. Since this is a legacy podcast, what does this word mean to you? And what would you like your holistic legacy to be? Hmm. I, um, well, I mean, I think I, I told you one of the things I told you when we started is like, I don't really think about my legacy. I, I sort of feel like it's out of my control. Yes. I and, remember that. Yes. And, it's kind of like my other, other people's perception of what they thought I was doing or, or, or what my life was going to be. And, you know, we have a lot of examples of, you know, really famous people that no one's ever heard of. Right. Like, like, um, so, and I try my best to not, if, if I can't control it to some extent, I want to not worry about it, you know? And so, but to answer your question, in a without with you know trying to be a good sport too um our family values are growth presence kindness responsibility and when i think about the things that i can control which is like you know basically how i live my life how i'm trying to live my life um the first part of my legacy is growth for sure so uh carol dweck growth mindset she says it's not always the smartest people who end up the smartest. And when I think about my own life, one of the things that like I hope to share with my kids by the way I live it is I'm, I was not ready to be a CEO when I was 22 years old. Some people are, I wasn't. It took very, very deliberate reading and reflecting and writing and growing and working on myself to get me to the point where I felt like I even had a chance, you know, to, to do something like this. Was this when you were back in Silicon Valley? No, no, no. This is like, I, I'm saying like, sil there's Silicon Valley CEOs that, you know, startup CEOs that have an idea and they can lead a company at 22 years old. You know, at 22 years old, I was working for a commercial bank in Maryland and ha could not have led a team, but I've, focus so much on my own development that I got myself to the point where I feel like I could get there. And I'm excited for where I can go from here, because once you start to grow and have faith in your ability to grow, it becomes really powerful. So growth for me is one, but then the second piece is, you know, leading by example for me is it's really underrated. Um, it's something that we, we talk to lots of families about. Um, and, and it's small, right? Like I'll give you a couple of examples here because I, it, it's really, it's really important to me. So the first one is I have a three-year-old and if you've ever hung out with a three-year-old, you know, they're not totally rational. Sometimes they can get on your nerves, you know, they're whiny, blah, blah, blah. And I like, I yelled at him and he went and he cried at my wife and it was like, dad yelled at me. And it really wasn't, he wasn't doing anything that crazy. I just had had a long day. And so I got down to like eye level with him and I apologized to him. And I was like, I am sorry. I, I didn't mean to yell. I had a super long day, man. And I took it out on you and that's not fair. Right. 
And if you think about, you know, you can scream at your kid to apologize all the time, or you can apologize to them a couple of times when you're wrong. And that will leave a lasting impact on them in a, in a really, really cool way. So leading by example, one other thing is, so I grew up in Syracuse, New York. I worked all, I worked all through pretty much my, most of my life. And Can you shovel I, the snow. Yeah. Oh yeah. Lots of that. Yeah. yeah. That's just part of getting to work. That's not even the work. <laughs> um, but I worked at this fried dough, world famous fried dough stand in Syracuse, New York called Pizza Free. It's like two foot long fried doughs and it's owned by a family. So I worked there all through high school and we would go to like, you know, Italian fest and, and balloon fest and all these festivals. You have to get there early. We'd smell like grease and oil and work long hours and do all this stuff. Why I'm sharing this story is because when we showed up at 630 in the morning on Saturday before, before the start of balloon fest, the owner was already there. Always. Every single time. And when we were cleaning up at midnight, pulling in like these gross hoses and uh, after like all day of being at like a fair or a carnival or something like that, he would be the dirtiest one, right? And he wouldn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do. I never even saw him like leave. He was just always there. Responsible. So, yeah, yeah. But setting this tone for everyone that is like, hey, the owner's cleaning up this gross hose. So if he's doing it, we all better do it. And I think that both like as a business leader now, when I think about what I should do to set the right example for my team, but also for the team that's in my house, leading by example and doing some of that kind of stuff, it's very, very applicable to how we're leading our own families. And so for me, legacy is growth and leading by example. I think that's a beautiful answer, especially because it speaks into that you're willing to walk the talk and you saw the positive role model, I might say, you know, up close and personal. And so you got to bear witness to that. And now you understand that it's not just um, telling, let's say your three-year-old son, like, yeah, clean up your toys. You're willing to like show them how to do it, how to put the toys back. And so it's right. not like it's above you. It's like, Hey dude, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you where you're at and respectfully. And I think that's, uh, I think that's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it. Sure. So speaking of hardcover coffee table books, will that story be in your hardcover coffee table book? Um, so I heard you say this on another podcast. So it's like, what is in my legacy coffee table book? Yeah. So the, actually I'll tell you the origin behind this quickly. So I had this, um, great grandfather on my father's side, Herbert Carlton, it was a century ago. Well, he may have been actually existed before a hundred years ago. And he was a successful insurance broker in, in Massachusetts. And he had multiple homes and multiple Cadillacs and a maid, et cetera, et cetera. And he never wrote a book of like what I called a hardcover coffee table book of like what were his best business and life lessons. I mean, I heard he was like quite the kick at the restaurants flirting with all the waitresses. Like he was a charismatic personality and maybe he had to be that way because he was in sales. Maybe he was naturally that way. And he mm. never wrote the book. And maybe it's because he never thought that somebody would want to read it. Um, but he uh, he didn't do it. And I'm curious. I want to know what he knew. But he yeah. obviously didn't write it down. And, and they were very good at taking the photographs, black and white photographs and uh, photographs of their vacations. And I look at how they dressed. And yeah, I just have got some questions. So Alex, what would be in your hardcover coffee table book? Um, it would probably be the password and login to get into relate <laughs> our, our software, our stuff will definitely be in the software. Um, because we're trying to also meet like these future generations where they are and create a durability component of, of, of what we're doing. Um, but certainly, you know, family purpose, which which to us is, can be intergenerational. It can be like a hundred year purpose statement. So for our family, our purpose statement is leave it better than you found it. That, that's something that my kids can take if they want to. It's broad, it has to be really broad. A purpose statement has to be really broad. Think of it like a North star for people. 
So when you're trying to figure out like, am I going in the right direction? You can use that purpose statement. And, and I think a lot of families have found value in a purpose statement. Certainly family values, we talked about this. Um, you know, one of the thing, certainly pictures and videos, but like maybe the really important ones and ones that you can tell a little bit of a story behind because like there's so many pictures out there. There's so many on our phones that like we're almost numb to like, like the pictures. Um, but I think what is interesting to me about you, Angelina, just in like our you know brief time together is you're also doing this work with your own family, which is not easy to do. You have a natural curiosity about the history and kind of what led to you being you um, that probably resonates with your clients. And like the, the thing that I feel like is missing in legacy is the narrative. Like when you think about, you know, telling us any story, you don't get the story through an estate planning document. You have to tell the story of a hero that encountered a problem. And, you know, like the, the, the normal storytelling things that we hear in every TED talk and that they give you in sales uh, presentation coaching and all this kind of stuff, like you have to give it to people in a way that they can be moved by it. So find a way to tell, you know, a story in a really cool, engaging way where, you know, you can tell your kids bedtime stories about your grandfather as a hero or as a dinosaur. And that's better than Disney. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Right. But like, if you're just like, your grandfather's name was Steve and he lived, here are the dates that he lived and he worked in a mill. It's like, okay, no wonder I'm not interested in that, right? But if you tell it in a way, if you like can think about your own life in that way too and and shape it, like find a way to bring some narrative into your family story and your legacy and like that will get carried on. And you can tell whatever story you want about your own life. You know, like if you think about your legacy, it's like, I can tell you all the, how brave I was and what a great hero I was like, fine, great. At least, at least it's compelling. And now maybe, you know, my grandkids have a, a semblance of like who I was and what's about what I, what I was about. Um, but find a way to like, like bring narrative into your legacy. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, I, I, I might have shared with you in our uh, icebreaker conversation that uh, on my dad's side, he's a 12th generation American and they were very good at documenting everything. And so I could talk to my dad for like 10 or 11 hours and he could walk me through everything and he knew everything. And I'm like, this is brilliant. And then I went to my mother's side, which uh, she's ethnic. And so it's more of um, the stories are past um, auditory, orally, uh, you know, not yeah. necessarily by the campfire, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. And so um, if that gets lost, then it, it's, it, it evaporates. And, and it's, so it's very interesting to see how different cultures approach it. And yet there is so much wisdom to be gleaned and it is better. I no, nothing against Disney, but I think that to know one's heritage and roots, it's like, Oh, well, maybe that's why I do that thing that I do, you know? Yeah. Right. And right. You're like, yeah, <laughs> that's it's where cool that comes from. And it's so it's, subconscious. It, that's right. It's cool. Then it like, like you could be an entrepreneur and someone, you know, if, if you're talking to the people in your family about this stuff, like, you know, that reminds me of your great grandmother. And she started this business and she had ideas like you do. And, you know, I think that resonates with people and it makes them then get interested in that character, right? Yeah. You have to find ways to like create those ties and then they're going to, you know, pass on those ties to, to their kids. And I think it's so important if somebody can know their roots, I think it just grounds them no matter the changing landscape and the, the changing times. I think it just adds to the mix. Yeah. What's, what's the, uh... What are any final closing thoughts and what's a, a website that you could share with the viewers or listeners if they would like to learn more? Sure. Yeah. Super easy. Totalfamily.io is our website. Uh, so you can go on there. You can learn, see, you know, you can see our, what our workshops are about. You can sign up, uh, see how easy it is to work with us. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn. 
we do some public webinars. We have one coming up in the uh, end of August. So I'm not sure when this is going up, but we have one of those in the end of August. And um, in about two and, weeks. Okay, great. Yeah, so so uh, maybe it'll be close then. But um, but totalfamily.io. And uh, yeah, we're, thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for speaking into your legacy, uh, whether it's a leadership by example or also just speaking into momentum. Um, I thought that was powerful. Um, and, and also the part about the values on the wall. Like if somebody walked into one's house and let's say the values were framed on the wall, that's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's been my pleasure to have you as a guest. I will just read out the closing paragraph real quick. In closing, I'm Angelina Crofton, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder of Legacy Planning, a boutique advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners and viewers, there can never be enough education and preparation in the mood or mode around your castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you're checking us out on YouTube, please remember to like, subscribe, share with your friends and family, comment and so forth. Or if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please remember to rate and review. And so thank you for joining us this week. And thank you, Alex, for speaking into your legacy.